All right, if you have your Bibles, then we'd ask to turn to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 25, and we're going to begin reading in the first verse, Isaiah 25. In the first verse, the Bible says, O Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name. For thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. For thou hast made of a city a heap, of a, def of a defense city a ruin, a palace of strangers to be no city. It shall never be built. Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee, the city of the terrible nation shall fear thee, for thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. Thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers, as the heat in a dry place, even the heat with the shadow of a cloud, the branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make people, make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines and of lees well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over people and the veil that is spread over the nations. He will swallow up death in victory and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces and the rebuke of his people he shall take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken it. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and watch care this evening. Lord, we praise you for being on the throne and having all under your feet. Lord, we praise you that this earth that seems so big and towering to us is nothing more than your footstool, Lord. We praise you for that. God, help us tonight to preach your word that would be pleasing to you. And we'd be thankful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, I'm going to be preaching tonight on the great promises of God. And many times we read through the scriptures and we never really pick up on what the promises are about. And a lot of times that's why we get the witties and the scaries and I'm going to quit is because we've forgotten the promises. We have forgotten what he said he would do. We've forgotten what he said he would secure. And we've forgotten what he already has secured. And as a result, we really can get down and out. And it is, uh, it is not a good thing. Now, I want you to remember in Isaiah's day that uh, Israel was in a mess with sin. In fact, defeat was very close to happening because they had let so many impurities in their individual lives and in effect national Israel. Uh, you know what's wrong with the United States? There's too much impurities in it. You know what's wrong with our dead churches? Too much impurity. See, the reason behind separation, and I might preach on this Sunday, the reason of the doctrine of separation is this, it keeps out impurities. It, it's not to make you look like a big Ike and I wear dresses all the time and uh, I don't grow my hair out long, men. And it is simply to give power into the churches because anything less will take power from the church. Right. And so we find then that in Isaiah's time, Israel was very much in the same circumstance, but here in the middle of the calamity that he predicts against Israel, he reminds them that their God loves them. And that's my, uh, <laughs> that's my encouragement to you, despite the situation that you're in, God loves you. He, he's interested in your outcome. He's interested in, the, in you serving him to the fullest. Now, a lot of times we forget that. And why don't I have a better job? Why don't I have more money? Listen, that's not what's important. Yeah. Are you going to live in victory or live in defeat? 
See, that's the real question. When we remember who's on the throne and how good God is, and we'll get to that, listen, there's no other option but to simply live in victory every day of our lives. So as Isaiah begins, he says, Oh, Lord, thou art God. Now, that seems like a very simple statement, but you know what? Uh, you know what most people are serving today? A little mini-God that hopes that you'll do something and hopes the world will turn out all right and hopes that uh, things will come into order. That is not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible has it all under his feet already. He speaks it, and it comes to pass. He puts his hand of protection on you, and you're protected good. Amen. That is the God of the Bible. Don't everybody, don't let, you know, this is the real thing with Armenian doctrine. It brings God down to our level. He's never been at our level. He never will be at our level. He's holy and righteous and infinitely good. Amen. That's the God of the Bible. And so we find as Isaiah is writing, and it seems like a simplistic statement, but it's wonderful. He's God. He, he's got it all under control. Then he makes this statement, I will exalt thee. Now, you know what? That's a very individual statement, and you can say it for yourself, but you can't say it for anyone else. I will exalt thee. You know what? Uh, according to what I understand about the Bible, uh, in marriage, me and Donna are linked for the rest of our lives as long as we're living. But I can't exalt God for Donna. I can't exalt God for my children. I, he says, I will exalt him. He committed personally. I'm going to lift up his name. I'm going to remind everybody how good he is. I will put him on top of everything. And that's why when we pray, don't you start out with your want-tos and your wish list. You, uh, uh, you start out like David did, thou art even God. Right. See, that's a whole lot different, isn't it? You know, if, if we believe everything's under his feet, like the, like the sea was when he was walking over to Gennesaret, then your problems are under his feet too. He knows what your condition is. He knows your need. So once you begin with simply praising God for who he is and for the things he already has done, and that will be, uh, that will uh, improve your power in prayer. Oh Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name. Now, you know, uh, uh, in often, uh, we don't get a hold of that. And, and I understand we reverence God. But do you know God's name? The rest of life's about, he's Jehovah. He's Jehovah Jireh. He, he's the everlasting God. From everlasting to everlasting. Do you ever start out your prayers like that? That's what I believe Isaiah's advice was, was to start him out and recognize that he is magnificent and holy and all-powerful. He'll get the job done, and I guarantee you it will go according to the perfect will of God. And, and, and we need that encouragement in the days which we live. Notice what he says, Thou hast done wonderful things. You know what? That needs to be personal. Now, we know about the crossing of the Red Sea, which I really think is not necessarily the best term because they were kicking up dust on their way. Uh, they went through the Red Sea. They didn't cross it. And uh, we know that he, he raised at least three from the dead. Uh, one of them was already rotten and caught him from the grave. So what my, but you know what is more of a thrill to my heart? He saved my soul. He, he made corrupt into incorruptible is what 1 Corinthians 15 says. He, he, he brought deadness to life. He did a work no 
one else could do. He brought, he brought life to deadness. That's the first thing. And you go all down through the years and think about how good God's been. You know what? I've never went hungry very much. I've always had something to eat. It might not be what I want. But you know what? God is good. You know what? Uh, if you ever get any... Uh, uh, problems with your lungs that interferes with your breathing, I guarantee you on the other side of it, you'll thank him for fresh air. Amen. See, sometimes we have to lose something to appreciate it, don't That's we? It. Yep. And so we find that every day we, uh, we need to name the things, just two or three, just what, what, what you can come up with, you praise him for what he's done. Now he says this, Thy counsels, thy advice, thy instruction, thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. So he's saying about this word that lays before us this evening that they are faithfulness. You, you, you have to depend on that. Listen, don't you go one minute by your feelings. You depend on that book and what it says every time. And listen, you be careful how you go to interpret it. That, you know, uh, the Bible says this, it is without private interpretation. Mm -hmm. That means what it says to me, it says to you, mm -hmm. and what it says to Jared, it says to you. So I don't believe that that's how it's put. Well, you know, I really don't believe how, it don't matter what you believe, it's just what it says. And, and, and we have to go with that. And, and so we find then, uh, as the Lord's people, that as Isaiah is writing that, he really appreciated the word of God when it was good and when it was not so good. Verse 2, for thou was made of a, a made of a city and heap. Now, this meaning the cities that were an enemy against God, against Jerusalem specifically. He says, I've made them a heap. Now, that was a prediction. It was not yet a reality. So you know what that took from Israel? Faith. He said, I'm gonna, I, uh, it's going to be a heap. It's going to be a heap. It's going to be nothing left. It's going to be a, an, inhabitable, an inhabitable place when I'm done with it. And you know what? The Bible says that we will have the ultimate victory. So what are you concerned about? What are you stressed about? What are you wringing your hands about? There, there, there's nothing to do. Is there not? Rather, we should go around in victory with our head, heads and our hands held up high, praising the Lord for who he is. Because uh, he's going to put the enemies under his feet. Uh, verse 3. Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee. Now, you underline in your Bible, or if you mark, if you don't, you remember it. Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee. So what's the only assumption that you can come to if you're not glorifying him? You're weak. You're weak. That's, and you know, all of us has raised babies here tonight. And you know what? If you don't feed a baby, it's going to get weak. It's going to get sickly. It's going to lose weight. Now, listen, I can feed you Sunday and Wednesday. But you know what? You're going to starve to death if that's all you're depending on. Right. Yeah. You'll be as weak as branch water. Amen. You know where that old saying comes from? You know what happens to a branch? It'll run while the rain's coming. And when the rain's gone, it'll run out. There's a little branch by my grandmother's house. And only time it rained, I mean, rain was when it was raining. And it was very, very soon gone. And so we, as Lord's people, we need to dig into that word in private study. And you can, you know, we use it as phones for everything else. Won't you get in there and search about the goodness of God? Won't you pull up something about the means of redemption? So I want you to see that... <laughs> Are you strong or are you weak? Are you glorifying God in what you do or are you denying him in what you do? That was, 
Uh, Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee. The city of terrible nations shall fear thee. Now, again, this is addressed to Israel. But uh, when, when I don't think they'll be scared of us. I don't think the people will be scared. But you know what? They do need to respect us. They need to know who we are. They need to know who we identify with. That's respect, is it not? When you think about New Testament church, and, and more important than us thinking about it, when, when, you, when you look outside and people in Dover think about New Testament church, what are they thinking about? See, we're known one way or the other. You're known individually, and you're, we're known as a group together. We have a collective testimony. Have you ever thought about your contribution to New Testament Baptist churches own collective testimony do you respect the word of God do you love this church do you pray for me as your pastor see every bit of that is testimony to your not only to your life but, but to this church's life too you, you see what I'm saying either, either you are on or you're off and that's certainly the way that we uh <laughs> We need to cling to this word is that we're all in, we're all on. Verse 4, for thou hast been a strength to the poor. Now, uh, that is not poor like no money. That means somebody in poor health, weak, going down, a strength to the poor. Poor in health. Poor uh, people were giving up on. Have you ever thought about, and, and so many years we've taken care of Joey, sometimes I forget about it, but have you ever thought if we didn't feed Joey, he literally would starve to death? He does not have the capacity to think, I'm hungry. There's some food in the kitchen. Isn't it a wonderful thing when you're too weak spiritually and God brings you a big old meal? If you don't believe that, you think about when Elijah was on the run and here comes an angel with that big meal laid out before him and he ate and he turned over slept. He got up again and he ate a second meal and the Bible said he went in the strength of that meal for 40 days. <laughs> we need that, don't we? Uh, listen, and in the last days, we need it so desperately because, listen, uh, the world would have you dry up on the vine if it could. And so he says, next, a, a strength to the needy in his distress. Now, to be in distress, to be anxious, there has to be a threat of some kind, a threat to your safety in some means. Now, uh, you think about what, what has threatened you spiritually. You know what? People, people will question the truths that we stand for. And they'll say, what about this? And what about that? and leads you to one verse, and they want you to read only that verse and not the context of the Scripture. And you know what? If we're not real careful, we'll say, hmm, never thought about it that way. And, and, and when we get to that point, you know what? We're under threat. We are under an attack. We're under uh, the devil's coming out, to get, coming out against us. And it says here, he is a strength to the needy in his distress. You know, you think about spiritually now, how many times you've been a needy, needy person when you desperately, desperately needed to hear from the Lord. You, you know why most people won't say that? They're ashamed to admit it. You know what? Uh, I, I've been trying to pastor for, been in the ministry for 26 years. And... I sometimes so desperately need you, don't you? I feel alone and empty and ready to quit. And then, you know, just like he did, they woke him up out of the floor of the ship, and he walks out and says, peace be still. 
And immediately everything's okay again. See, uh, a lot of us live in that stress, don't we? And certainly that's what the devil would have you to do because listen, you're not fit for ministry when you're in that constant state of depression. You can't even, you can't even take care of yourself, much less help somebody else. And so uh, that's our condition, but he can get you out of it. A refuge from the storm. Getting in the refuge from the storm. You know what? Uh, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to work out fine. Because you know what? My experience, at least carnally, that's not true. But I will say that he's refuge. When, uh, when that storm's about to turn your ship up on its side, you run to the refuge. When the news is just about as bad as it can get, run to the refuge. You know what? We all think we have trouble going on. Just think about this tonight. Uh, you could be like Brother Mark. You know what I'm saying? Run to the refuge. You know, uh, we're not nearly as bad off as we think we are, are we? Run to the refuge. Get, you know, uh, the Bible says this, that we need to be in Christ. Now, you can't go out to run off and say, you get into it, but you don't. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I would say, <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not reducing the atonement. You are atoned either way if you're saved. But I haven't always been in Christ, and don't tell me you have either. Uh, we, need, we, we need to be in a situation where he's our refuge. Not CNN news, not Fox News, not any of the foolishness that goes on out there today, not mama, not daddy. He's a refuge. Run to Christ. When, when the most horrific thing happens, run to Christ. And I will guarantee you there'll be a soulless there that, that, that you, really, uh, you really can appreciate till it happens. And so we find as the Lord's people, uh, we need to do that. He says, a shadow from the heat, when it's as hot as it can get, he, 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 he'll come and, and, and lay that shadow over us. That's what he did for Jonah, was it not? And Jonah didn't appreciate it, so he took it away from him. You remember that? And, and so we find that he even protects us from the heat. When the blast of the terrible ones is at a storm against the wall, thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers now notice what it says. Who does that? He's talking to Israel as a nation. He's talking to us as a people. Thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers. What's the noise of strangers today? It's all right for men to marry men. It's all right for women to marry women. And you know what? On top of that, we're going to give them some babies to raise. You know, we need to noise up against that, don't we? That's wrong. That, that's, that, that's foul in the sight of God. Today, uh, this week, I think it was yesterday or Monday in the state of California, they said it was all right for men to approach boys as long as they're more, no more than 10 years apart. That's disgusting. You know what? When I was a boy, they called they they called that child rape. When when I was a, a boy, they called it molestation, right? You see where we're at now. See, uh, we don't need to say, "Well, that's the day we live in." You know what? That's a cop's way out. Right. Uh, nothing more than just a compromiser in every way. What we need to do is say, "You know what?" You can do what you want to. You can say what you want to, but that's still molesting the child, right? Yeah. Right. And, and and so we, as the Lord's people, in the midst of what we live in, do not forget to to speak against the terrible ones. Answer them. Thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers as the heat in a dry place, even the heat of the shadow of a cloud. The branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low. We know, uh, you know, uh, it, it may get down to just a, just a handful of people left. 
But if we are faithful, the hand the hand of the terrible ones shall be brought low. Uh, they won't be able to stop us. They won't be able to make us quit meeting if <laughs> still speak against them. You know, uh, up in Kentucky, it was a little bit worse than we were. But you know what? <laughs> they shouldn't quit meeting. In fact, the governor of Kentucky today, federal charges were brought against him. Right. Good. They needed to be spoke. He needed to be spoken against. Because see, what he violated was the Constitution of the United States. You know, I, I did this little quiz online the other day, and everybody failed it but me. It was just one question, and the question was it was even multiple choice. I felt like I was back in nursing school. Do we live in a republic, a democratic republic, I mean a, a democracy, or a constitutional republic? And everybody, Sarah got it right, everybody put a democracy. <coughs> we do not. We live in a constitutional republic, and that constitution is still supposed to be our ending guide. Right? Most people don't even know that today. You know, that should be a public school system at its very top, ain't it? <laughs> and, and, and so we find then it's the Lord's people. Don't you be fearful to speak out. Don't you be In fact, I believe the scripture's telling us we actually have a responsibility to do it. Verse 6. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all the people a feast of fat things. A feast of wines on the leaves, and I had to look up that leaves. I didn't really know what it meant. And that leaves is a, uh, you know, when we make wine here for the Lord's table, the impurities come up to the top, and you get that's the leaves. And you know, way I understand this here, David's getting both. He's getting good wine. He's getting the leaves. You know what that is? That's a mixed diet for the Christian. We get a mixed diet all the time, and I'm afraid a lot of times there's more leaves than there is wine. Just chomping down on it anyway. You know, uh, enough of that will literally make you sick. You'll vomit up. Because most of that is spoiled anyway. That's the impurities coming off, and you need to drag that mess off. And then you've got the good wine in the mud. And, and so we as the Lord's people, uh, be cautious of a, a mixed diet. Be cautious. You know what we should do? If we believe it, stand for it. You know what? If you don't believe anything about dress, don't pretend that you do. Right? And, and, and so we see that the nation was going to get this mixed diet, and the question was, will they know how, what to get rid of and what to keep? And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people, not just, not just the Lord's people, all people, a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the leaves, a fat, a, a fat things full of marrow, of wines on the leaves well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people. Now, some of that is Israel, some of that's his enemies. Now, I want you to see that he how he accomplishes it through their diet. You know why people believe there is no God? Very same reason that Pharaoh did. It's the diet he made. If you're constantly taught there is no God, you'll believe it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, how about sending your kids out to the public school? Right? That's what they'll hear down there. They'll hear that it's a democracy and we can vote whomever and vote any law into existence that we want to. That is not the truth. If the new law violates the Constitution, the Constitution comes first. I wonder if they ever thought about that with the sodomite marriage. You see what I'm saying? 
And, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, if you eat the wrong thing long enough, you're going to begin to believe it. You're going to begin to say, hey, that must be right. But you know what? As the Lord's people, we need to stay off that filthy diet, and all that we need, everything we need, is right here before us. And so he says he's going to feed it both. Verse 8. He, meaning the Lord God, he will swallow up death in victory. You know what? According to my understanding of life and how it's taught me in nursing and understand that book, every one of us is facing death. Every one of us, that's a reality. And you know, you really never get over death. Uh, me and Donna was talking about Judy from the way over here. And I can't remember what it said, but, but literally the hair stood up on the arms. You know what? Because that's a reality. Judy's gone. 42 years old. I'm already lived 10 years longer than she did. You know what that taught me? That death was reality. And there's no escape from it. Uh, it ought to also make us learn that, that life's precious. You going to live it for God or live it for yourself? I remember when we got the bad news about Judy and that old nursing sign and me began to chug it. Listen, I knew then, unless God intervened, there was no hope. And you know what? Instead of thinking, and this may be a shame to me because I pray for it, but instead of thinking about Judy, I began to think about Donna. And I began to think, you know what? That could be me tomorrow or that could be her tomorrow. And I went out and got two dozen red roses and took them home to my wife. You see, we need to hold life as precious as that. And you think about that. What have you really done for the cause of Christ in your life? I mean, really. Very sobering thought, isn't it? That's right. Very sobering thought. Because listen, when we leave this place, according to this scripture, we all going to do that. When we leave this place... Nothing else is going to matter how good you were and uh, how many buildings you built and how nice your home was. Listen, it'll all be under the sea at that point. And all that will matter and make things eternal is what you have done for Christ. Right. Pretty sober, isn't it? Very sober to me when I think about my ministry. Sometimes uh, I think it's pretty poor. And you know what? I'll give an account for everything I've said. Many, see, uh, me and Jerry are in the same boat. Uh, with a special call on your life, according to what I understand, there's also a special crane. But if you, uh, if you don't, uh, we have accountability that comes with that, don't we? We have to give a testimony for that as much as we did in our life. You know, years ago, uh, there was a man in the nursing home at Dover. I don't know if I was the director of nursing or if I was a staff nurse. I can't remember. It, it's been years ago. And there's this man who came in. He's probably in his 40s. He'd been a Southern Baptist preacher. Got to running with a woman. Left the ministry. Took up a woman after woman. Horrible alcoholic. And you know, this left a lasting impression. He got oral cancer. And he went down. And he couldn't even speak. The Lord took his voice, did he not? You can believe what you want to believe about that, but that's what I believe. The Lord took his voice. You're going to use it for God? You're going to use it? <laughs> You're going to use it for yourself? Not going to use it at all? You know, that's what most of us do. It's not that we necessarily try to ring our own bell. It's just we don't say nothing at all. Which to me is far worse. And, and so we as the Lord's people, we need to understand that that is a reality. But look at the good news. He will swallow up death in victory. Our Lord Jesus Christ, when, when he was risen 
And you know what? A lot of people say he was risen on the third day. I'm not sure about that, but they discovered it on the third day. The Bible said he spent three days and three nights in, in the belly of the earth. And I believe he was preaching the gospel to people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when they came, when he came out, <laughs> remember they went down that morning and uh, said the stone was already rolled away. And old, old John, he looked in there, saw two men in white array. Yeah. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Yeah. You know what? Death was gone on that day. Yes, we will face a fleshly carnal death. And the reason why is because huh, this flesh is corrupt. It has the sin nature of Adam. And you know what that is? You know what the... the sentence of that is it's death and we will give it up one way or the other at some point uh someday that that time is coming yes, yes. but remember it's swallowed up in victory if you know the lord jesus christ tonight in the free pardon of sin you know what you're in wonderful spiritual shape because it's swallowed up in victory. He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all their faces. Now, uh, I'm not very much of a, of a crying person. A few times on the pulpit, I'll get happy and begin to cry. Uh, uh, grief, you know, but being grief stricken, and I don't know why this is, and I think the older I get, the worse I am about it. Um, but the last time I really remember crying in grief was when Judy died. You know, shame on me. She'd been gone almost 10 years. You know, that must have happened that time. Why well, can't I be grief stricken over that? Uh, yeah. You know what? He, he'll come one day and say, you know what, <laughs> Larry, it's all okay. You don't have to stress about it anymore. He'll wipe our tears away and say, enter you in into the glories of the Lord. A wonderful time it'll be. Glory, a glorious thing that's coming. And, and we look forward to uh, being <laughs> with the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the ceaseless ages. And, uh, the great things that he's going to do. He should swallow up death in victory, and the Lord will wipe away their tears from off all their faces, and the rebuke of the people shall he take away from off, from, from off all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. Now, I think that very last part, and if you know your Bible, that is not, uh, that's not given in 1 Corinthians 15. The last part is not, it's not there. About the removing, removing of the rebuke. And you know why? It's because the time, by the time of Paul writing to the church at Corinth, it had already happened. <laughs> the rebuke was gone. It was done. He didn't have to remind him anymore. So, what we need to consider tonight, are you really saved? Or are you just playing music? Do you really know the Lord Jesus Christ? Because see, the only way that you can enjoy this rebuke to be gone is know the Lord Jesus Christ personally, intimately. Know him better than you know your wife. It's very important to know him. If you don't know him, seek the Lord while he may be found. That's the best advice I can give you. All right.